Hey everybody, Dylan Bowman here, one of the founders of Free Trail and the host of the Free Trail podcast. Thank you for watching our video podcast. A couple of things before we get started. Number one, please do join Free Trail Pro, our great community for trail runners from around the world. There's a lot of great perks involved in that membership and we would love to have you on board. Number two, a big thank you to our sponsors here in the video podcast. We don't do real commercial breaks, so I just wanna give them a major shout out on the front end here. We have some discount codes in the show notes that you can take advantage of. Number one, Speedland, of course, the makers of the GS Tam, the shoe that bears the Free Trail logo on it and a product that we worked on to bring to market in the spring of 2023. Our other annual partner is Gnarly Nutrition, makers of fantastic training and racing nutritional supplements that will really help you on your trail journey. We always have a third partner on the show that rotates throughout the year. So depending on who it is now, you can find a link and a discount code in the show notes for that partner as well. But a big thank you to the sponsors who do make our podcast possible. Number three, last but not least, we would really appreciate it while you're here to smash the subscribe button on the free trail YouTube channel. You can also click the bell icon to get notifications whenever we post new content. We are working very hard to keep you inspired, informed, and entertained here in the great sport of trail running. Thank you so much. Enjoy the show. David Callahan, Jay Kelly, welcome to the free trail podcast, guys. Nice to see you. Nice. How you doing? Good. We're good. Good to see you. Jay, how are you? I'm doing great. Good to see you, Dylan. Likewise. So David's been on the show before, but uh, it was just sort of like a free trail Friday live stream, not a traditional podcast. But Yeah, this is the real deal now. I'm on the real episode now. So yeah, this, is, this is big time. Got promoted to the main show here, Cal. <laughs> uh, no, but, you know, David and I, especially, you know, we chat in text pretty frequently. Um, and, you know, Jay, when we see each other too, you know, uh, you're some of my favorite guys to talk about sort of like the business side of the sport, the dynamic. And anyway, I'm excited to have you both on the show here together. And I have to propose my traditional opening question to you guys. And I figured that this would also be a fun way to add another layer to it. And that question is always, what makes you, you? So just sort of like contemplating your unique strengths and weaknesses as human beings, but also adding the additional context of your business partnership. So maybe David, we can start with you. What makes you, you, and, and how do those strengths and weaknesses make for a productive business relationship with Jay? Yeah. So um, I, I would say mine is, is both a strength and a weakness at the same time, sort of depending upon when it rears its head. But um, for me, you know, I, I feel the happiest when everything is like five feet out in front of me, like a, a, every single thing that I'm working on is just out of my grasp. And, and so every day I get to get up and chase that. I, I, I'm, I'm very unhappy when I have nothing to chase out in front of me. And so what that, that's a good thing. And that the ideas churn and, and we're trying to push the platform forward and the business forward and my personal life forward, it, it drives my wife nuts. Um, but it also can be chaotic at times because sometimes other people need to catch up and, and actually get some time to work on the ideas and not just get the next six ideas sort of thrown at them. So depending upon when that happens, um, that, that, that can be a strength and a weakness, but yeah, I always, I always want something to chase. So. Okay. So now Jay, you, you go next and then maybe we'll tie the two things together in the business relationship. Yeah. I mean, I love to, um, I love to synthesize things. Um, so, you know, there's so many wonderful things from, you know, my my history and my life and my interests synthesized in this one, um, you know, this one job. So, you know, there's sport and there's the outdoors and there's technology and there's art and there's a lot of profession and a lot of passion. And so, um, I I like taking those things and pulling them together and, and making them make sense and then also making them sort of move forward. So um, I think you can kind of see how these these two uh, characteristics may may sort of dovetail. David's talking about a, a swirl of ideas and I'm talking about sort of pulling everything together into this nicely constructed jigsaw puzzle. What a beautiful thing. The dreamer and the synthesizer. <laughs> it's really important two sides of the same coin, isn't it? David, anything you want to add to that? Because I think 
you know, obviously this is something that I think about a lot with our small team here. And I think I very much represent David's personality characteristics and my wife, Harmony, and um, other members of our team are probably more on the J side of that equation. Yeah. So I, I joke that, that J keeps all the trains on schedule. And I just keep trying to attach cars to the back of the train as fast as I can. And so Jay does a very good job and the rest of the team does as well of reminding me just like, just slow down. Like that'll be there in three weeks and, and we can deal with it. Um, but, but it, it works really well. And, and when Jay and I got into this, um, that was not, we didn't plan that structure, that, that working relationship. We didn't divide and conquer and conquer those roles intentionally it's it's really how they they both materialized organically over time and and now i can't imagine it being any other way um and so it's 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 exciting we're we're never short of ideas um often short of cash to do the ideas but never short of idea same (laughs) (laughs) uh but it's you know that's an exciting time for the sport right when when you see you know, n- none of us feel like we're at the end of the road, right? That this, there, there are no more good ideas. There's no more good opportunities. That that would be a really hard place to be for all of us if we felt like the sport had completely exhausted itself. Yeah. And so it's great that the only limiting factor for us right now is, um, you know, can can we find the right, you know, can, can, can enough of the right money enter the sport to do the right things at the right time? So yeah. that's, that, that, that's that's a good place to be. Oh, what a great way to start. Well, I'm glad to have you both on the show. It's probably been, what, two and a half or three years since you guys bought the platform or can sign up from the founder, Mark Gilligan. It's my- September, September 25th, 2020 in the, in the dark doldrums of, of the COVID. Pandemic. Right. <laughs> okay. So three years now. So maybe just to set the context for the listeners who are less familiar with the story, maybe just... In, you know, reintroduce that history for us, what you saw in the business to convince you it was worth taking a risk on at that time when events were extinct, it seemed like. Yeah. yeah. Um, and start that, David, just the, the the origin, origin story, and then and then hand it off to you. So, um, you know, as, as I think we mentioned, David and I, um, you know, we both have... Uh, you know, a, a past in, in kind of technology and we had been working on some projects together and I was actually looking to um, see if there was a use case for a, a technology platform. I had a, a mobile app in, in the race registration space. And so went and talked to some race director friends that I had and they said, yeah, that would be great. However, there's this other platform that has about 80% of the market. Good. Yeah, and it would be pretty hard to to displace them. But uh, this the, the the founder is like probably ready to sell. It's just one and a half people running this thing, and it's getting really difficult to run. And so I got introduced to Mark Gilligan, the founder, who was living in the NorCal area. And uh, our our first due diligence, you know, sort of meetings were really running around the trails of Lake Tahoe together. And I had my phone out and I was like trying to take notes without tripping over a root and breaking my nose. And Mark literally was taking customer service calls in between answering my questions while we were trail running. People who, you know, like didn't recognize a charge on their card were calling Mark's personal cell phone. Race directors who were, you know, wondering about a certain feature set were calling Mark's personal cell phone. So, Perfect. Yeah. So I I took this back and then there's a group of, you know, kind of five of us here in Nashville um, and uh, and and said, you know, this looks really interesting. And then, David, uh, you can you can sort of enter you know, kind of, uh, the picture at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, Jay and I both also sort of came from the endurance space. We, you know, I, I, I raced triathlons for years and years and years before kids came along. Um, Jay was also a big trail runner. And so we, you know, the dream of everyone, right. Combine your passion and profession. And, and all of a sudden there was this opportunity in front of us. And so that was fall of 2019, um, and so we got we got really excited between fall and March, of, beginning of March of 2020, which is when we really thought this thing was going to happen. And then COVID hit and, and the whole world shut down and every race was shut down. And we thought, oh, my gosh, like this is it. 
the, the, there's no way this platform is going to be able to survive this. Who knows how long racing will be gone. This it, it's just the black swan event. Um, but your, your question of, of what got us really excited about it and got to you know, push us over the finish. It was the community. I mean, I know that might sound trite, but it was totally the community. We watched from March until July of 2020. And what we saw was that the racer supported the race directors, the race directors supported the platform. And we said, well, that's, that's unique because I'm watching over in triathlon and Ironman is getting sued left and right. There's class action lawsuits against Ironman. I'm thinking, wow, like this is, there's something very different happening between these two sports. And so the reason we got re-engaged with Mark in July was, was because of the community. We felt like this relationship that existed between the race directors and the platform and the race directors and the runners and the runners and the platform was something that we could do. We, we could do really good things with. And so that drove us back into the conversations and ultimately September of 2020 with no vaccine on the horizon, heading into flu season. Like was, when we look back on it and we think about how in the world did we convince our wives to let us buy this? And yeah. we, when it was, it, but, but, you know, silly wild ambition that we thought that that we could we could sustain that period and if we could just get on the other side of it if we could just survive long enough that that we would have a really interesting opportunity with a really great community so that's what it was what a great leap of faith and what a great foundation to build from you just mentioned the three sides of the marketplace the platform the race directors the runners i kind of want to talk about all of those. So maybe David, let's start with the race directors. Previously, when we did our live stream, the thing that sticks out in my memory from that was you calling them creators. And we've since talked about that a couple of times privately. So maybe explain that philosophy again about why you use that language about the race directors, sort of rebranding it, reframing it as creators and and how Ultra Sign Up as a platform thinks about servicing those creators. Yeah, we're we're fortunate on the Ultra Sign Up team because we get to see we get to see the sport of trail racing on a macro level. So we get to see thousands of events come onto the platform every year, and we get to see that they all share some common themes. They're trail racing. They're set at certain distances. You know, they, they've got some commonalities to them. But you know, take for example the Marin Headlands. Like there, there's racing on the Marin Headlands all the time. And, but people are choosing to do this race director's race instead of that race director's race at any given time because they've created something. They've created a community. They've created a unique way to travel that course. They've created a vibe that is so unique to them, and people want to be part of that. And so for us at Ultrasonic, we get to see this across the spectrum. So we see how it happens in the in the Northeast and the Pacific Northwest and then down South and in the middle. Like it, there's there's all this, this unique culture and character that's coming out and and these race directors often get started because they have a favorite trail they experience it themselves in a certain way and they want to somehow bring that same experience to more people they they, they want to expose those people to the way that they experience the trail and they do that through creating their their race name creating the course creating the shirts like all, all of that the messaging that happens on social media is is all a, a reflection of of their character. And, and it's, it's a truly unique way in America that, that that happens. If you go to Europe and you look at the trail racing in Europe, may, maybe separate from UTMB and the Palettis, the, the, the courses, the courses you're racing are the names of the courses. When you come to the U S you race a race director's race, you race Jamil's race or Jason's race or Candace's race or Dylan's race. It's, it's a really unique inter- interconnection between the race director and that event that, that is that's special in the U S. So. Yeah. so it's so interesting. What a unique way to look at it as opposed to podcasters or YouTubers, you know, race directors are also creators in their own way. Jay, one of the things David and I recently talked about, again, going back to you being the operator and the synthesizer is that, you're usually sort of not like Mark Gilligan. I don't think race directors are calling your personal cell phone, but that you do a lot to, you know, listen to the race directors request to sort of hear their pain points, see what's working well for them and formulate the plan and the product to the unique needs of those race directors. Is there anything you want to say about that part of ultra signups operation, how you build something that race directors want to use? 
Jay, yeah. give them your cell phone. They can all call your cell phone. Jay, yeah. at the end, Jay will give you a cell phone number. We'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> Believe me, they, they, they probably already have it. Um, but no, I, I think I think it really all starts with empathy, right? I mean, right when we, um, you know, kind of moved out of COVID phase into, my goodness, we need to meet all these people and we need to make sure that we understand them. We, we actually did a... a, a pretty um sub- substantial series of like structured video recorded interviews with many of our race directors and we weren't asking them like what feature do you want or i mean a lot of that stuff kind of came out but we really wanted more than anything to understand like what is it like to stand in your shoes like what keeps you up at night you know, what, what is the most joyful thing that you have to share with people? And so, so we, we, we spent a lot of time doing that. And David, you know, you and I talked about this a little bit earlier. I, I have a, a, a couple of unique experiences um, as we think about race directors as artists, just kind of in, in the space of, of the arts. Um, one is just my own, like I did an MFA in, in creative writing and, <laughs> and my, my creative process was actually, um, uh, it, it was, uh, unleashed by running. So anytime I had to write, I would go on a run and I would run until the line starts spilling out. And then I would run home as fast as I can and pull out these notebooks and sweat over them. I've got all these notebooks of, of lines that are just smeared ink, just covered in sweat. <laughs> so, so it's always been linked to art, but then uh, fast forward a few years. Um, and I was one of the, uh, founding, um, executives in, a uh, uh, a cable, uh, channel called the documentary channel. And so all we dealt with was like these documentary filmmakers who had a very unique point of view that they wanted to share with the world. And with that unique point of view came intensity and passion. And sometimes, you know, that spilled out into, you know, the conversation. And so just, just knowing how to start from a place of empathy understand what the stressors are, and then just do your best to sort of walk people through what the best outcome could possibly be is something I already had some experience with, had some personal experience and some professional experience with, and and have brought into this. But that's just me. Like We have a, an incredible team who, who are just really kind individuals and thoughtful individuals, and they, uh, they, they start from the same place. So. That's beautiful. Business, sport, and art. They're all the same thing at the end of the day. Aren't they? <laughs> so maybe from that point of empathy, Jay, this would be a good place to like maybe provide a practical example of maybe a pain point that surprised you or something that you learned once you guys took over the business and and then like an advancement you made to the platform to help service these creators in a more effective way. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that we <clears throat> heard from from RDs um, as an example was, you know, like the amount of time that they spend just doing tons of small things, mm-hmm. lots of small things. It's almost like a death of a thousand cuts. And you know, pe- people came to us and said um, in in some of those interviews. Um, and this was sort of a, a, a legacy platform feature, you know, that, that the communication tool from race directors to runners was was too much like Twitter and not a, enough like MailChimp. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so we we're like, yeah, you're right. And that just means you have to sort of recreate this thing over and over again. So uh, we built a tool that allowed for them to create templates, you know, so that they could reuse those templates over and over. And we had some preset templates that they could use one for, you know, pre-race day, one for race day, one for emergencies, another one for, you know, like after the results are in for photos. So um, that's one example, but it just, it started really with like, we're just having to do so many little things. And we thought, well, what's, what's one way that we can just cut down on some of that time? Yeah. Yeah. Time is precious. So then let's talk about the runner side of the marketplace. And David, one of the things that you say frequently and that you and I have talked about a bunch is like how ultra signup can 
be there for participants from registration to race day. And I recall when we were talking like earlier this year, probably back in the spring, you said something about how like the first two years were just about like cleaning things up, settling in, and that now you were really ready to kind of push the business forward. And I think specifically the focus was going to be on the runner side of the marketplace and this registration to race day philosophy. What sort of progress have you made there? And how do you think about, you know, how you can service the runners in, you know, with the platform as well, in addition to the creators and the race directors? Yeah, it's internally, there's, there's, there's a few mantras that, that get hammered on all the time. Um, the, the registration to race day journey is, is a really, really important window of time for us to, to try and engage with the runners because the goal is for our runners to show up to the start line, happy, healthy, and ready to race. That's that, that is a guiding light inside the company is that what decisions, what products, what, you know, what community connections can we make that will, that will enhance the race day experience for the runners and, and put them on the start line, giving them the best possible chance for success. Uh, because if they have, if they show up happy, healthy, and ready to race, and they have a great experience on race day, odds are they're going to stay in the community, and they're going to race again. From a brand perspective, they're going to buy more shoes, more packs, more poles, more gels. From a content perspective, they're going to listen to podcasts, and they're going to get magazines. They're they're going to stay part of this ecosystem. And if they have a great, coaches, they're going to get massages. Yeah. They may even yeah. hire an agent if they're professional. Yeah. <laughs> and if they have a great experience, they're going to become evangelists for the sport. There's no trail runner that runs on trails today who has never tried to invite a friend to come run with them. It, 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 it inevitably happens. I'm, I've experienced something that's life changing for me. You've got to come try this. You've got to just come out on the trail with me once. That only happens if they have great race day experiences. And it's, Dylan, you're a race director now. You know that it's, you've got too many things on your plate to also take on the responsibility of trying to help these runners show up to the start line happy, healthy, and ready to race. You, you do what you can, but it's difficult. And so at scale, what we're trying to do is, is how can we help these new 50K runners that have never run a 50K before? Let's cohort them off. Let's figure out ways that we can talk directly to them. Let's give them really actionable content. Let's, let's, let's teach them how to use polls. Let's teach them how to pack and drop bag. Let's teach them how to pace and eat, eat calories on the course. All for the purpose of hoping that we can get them to the start line happy, healthy, and ready to race. So some of the things that we've done, you know, we launched, we launched content uh, through the platform almost two years ago. And, and unless you've been in one of those cohorts, you may not have seen this, but we have been doing registration to race day content campaigns that have been delivering targeted content to runners along the way with that, with that sole purpose of um, let us, let us help you along the way. And, and what's, what's been really re rewarding about that is we can actually see that people are opening that, that content, they're reading it, and then they're coming back to that same piece of content week after week after week. And so it's, 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 it's reassuring to us that not only do they find value in it, but they want to come back and read it again. They want to get a little more value as they're continuing to work their way down that journey. Um, and so, you know, for us, we're uniquely positioned because we... You know, we're, we're the only place that knows that these people have registered for a race today that's six months away. We know the journey that they're on. We know where that course is going to be. We know what the distance is. We know what the weather's probably going to be like. We know how people have done their, you know, have raced that course before. And so we're going to continue to lean into that and try and provide actionable content, strong community, support, knowledge. There's so much wisdom in this sport from past participants, from the legends, but it's difficult to get that information into the hands of the runner. The, the burden's entirely on the runner to go find all of this. And it's it's in this huge morass of Google and magazines and podcasts and some on Strava. It's just, it's just everywhere. And these runners have to find it. And so what we're trying to do is, Jay, the synthesizer, how can we it's synthesize bad. this down and deliver it to people so they can actually find value in it and spend more of their time doing what they want, which is running and not as much time worrying about all this, all this, all this other stuff. Yeah. I want to come back and talk about media stuff in a second, because I think we could have a long conversation riffing on that together. And 
various different strategies and this morass of this abundance of podcasts and training plans and blog posts and things like that. And we're both. It's, it's every podcast, but this one, this one's great. Exactly. So don't worry. About it. exactly. <laughs> I'm not contributing to the noise myself. <laughs> um, but one thing that I thought it would be fun to, to riff on together too. And something that David and I talked about recently was like, whether or not the sport is in a bubble. And I think because you guys have the business that you do, you have unique vantage point from which to form opinions about the state of the sport, the health of the sport, the growth of the sport, et cetera. And obviously for the last 15 years, we've seen this massive growth, this tailwind that's benefited both of our businesses. But I don't know, part of me feels that we may be in a bit of a bubble. Like it sometimes does feel like a tulip mania, especially with this abundance of content and things around this niche sport. So anyway, just opening up that conversation. And one of the observations I shared with David is like, there's certain, uh, all the big brands are in the space now. And there's certain of those big brands without naming names, whose product you've absolutely never seen on like an average trail runner at a local group run or walking through uh, the expo at these races. And eventually those brands, like they're going to need to sell their product in order to remain in our community. And so part of me is nervous that we're going to see a mass exodus, uh, especially of these highly capitalized brands once they realize that this is a really small sport. So anyway, I'd like to just open that up to you guys. Are we in a bubble? Jay, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, I I don't think we're in a bubble. Um, I think I think there is growth. Um, I think the growth is healthy. Um, I think it's sustainable. And I think it's why the brands are coming in, because they see that it's healthy and sustainable. Um, and, you know, I think I think there's longevity to it. Um, uh, you know, whether or not brands will come in and then go, I mean, that's happened several times <laughs> in the space. Like, you know, again, without naming brands, you know, they do come and they go and then they come back. And the reason they've, you know, there's some that have come back several times. They come back several times because every time they come back and look, it's growing at the same, like pretty healthy, sustainable pace. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'm not too worried about it. Um, and, you know, I think the, the interesting sort of purview we have into it is sort of the um, it's, it's the trail uh, racing as a subset of, of trail running, which is a subset of running and also an overlap sub subset of all of these other outdoor sports. So if you look at the sport, you know, just growing on its own, like David, you, you gave the dynamic of, I've had this amazing transformative experience. I'm going to invite somebody else. That is its own kind of like network effect. And that's going to keep happening over and over again. But then there are all these on ramps from all these other places. And again, some of it's from road runners who are kind of burnt out bored and they want something new. Some of it is, you know, people who are, you know, in kind of adjacent outdoor sports, mountain biking, you know, rock climbing, and it's just kind of a natural um, so with so many on ramps and, and, uh, and then that sort of transformative experience aspect and sharing, um, I think it's, I think it's got plenty of room to grow. So that's, that's my uh, totally, uh, unrehearsed with David <laughs> perspective, David, I don't know if you feel the same way, but you, you can, yeah. if you want. Yeah, I, I, I do feel the same way. It, you know, when you look at bubbles, they, they normally have much more rapid growth than what we're seeing in this space. We're, we're seeing growth and it's, it's exciting and it, and it is robust, but it's not 200% growth, right? It's not, you know, it's, it's not growing at that level. If it were growing at that level, you know, um, what, what you then start seeing is, is companies really like prettying themselves up for sale all the way across the industry because they recognize that oh, I need to sell while this thing is like <laughs> before it pops. Yeah. And, and I don't, feel any of that happening in the space right now. Um, with, with that being said, if, if we don't figure out 
how to better support the runners, better support the racers for us in, in this in this registration or race day example again. I do think that we we do run the risk of of having the sport contract in years to come. And, and by that I mean when new people make their way to the sport, if they don't get fully integrated into a community, if they're forced to travel this road alone, um, if they're forced to figure out all these answers by themselves, then I don't think that they become really secure long-term members of the community. And by that, they don't invite their friends. They don't stick around. They dabble in it and then they leave. And, and so I think as this growth is happening, um, brands and content creators, everyone's thinking about the next customer. Like, how do I get the next customer? Well, we've got lots of customers right here that we're not doing a great job of taking care of right now. And, you know, you talk to any salesperson, they'll say it's a whole lot easier to sell to a current customer than to go find a new one. But we, we are not done taking care of the customers that exist in our sport right now. And by that, I mean, connecting them with community, connecting them with knowledge and experience, um, have, having these deep rooted communities. It, it, if we can focus the industry's time, energy and resources on that, then I think the growth will continue to sustain because it will be the only place that that community of support exists. And that will make trail running really, really unique, really, really enduring and stable. So, so we do a lot of work talking to brands about refocusing their attention from Black Friday to Christmas or showing up at race expos to getting deeper into that funnel of holy cow, I've just registered for my first 100 mile race. And I have no idea what I'm doing. And I'm terrified. Like I'm, I'm, I'm excited and terrified all at the same time. And brands have an opportunity with their professional runners and their R&D teams and all the resources that they have to put their arm around that runner and say, hey, I'm here to help you. Yeah. Whether you buy my shoe or not, I'm here to help you. Like we know how to get you from here to there and let us, let us be part of that. And what it creates is, sustain gratitude for that brand because you actually were there for them and you actually provided value and weren't just trying to sell shoes to them. And so, oh, sorry. so anyway, that's my soapbox. That's my, <laughs> well, I, I love the optimism guys. And I don't know from my perspective, and maybe this is just the scared operator, entrepreneur, small business owner in me, but you know, the brands feel so fragmented right now. The media feels so fragmented right now. Even like race directing feels really fragmented right now. And I'm like, is anybody making money here? <laughs> well, is everybody going to leave once they realize trail runners hate spending money? But anyway, I mean, we all love the game. We all love the sport. We all love the community. And um, yeah, the hard part is trying to figure out how to build businesses within it. But going back to what we talked about earlier, it is an exciting time and there does seem to be opportunity. And, you know, sort of part of the tailwind that we're feeling right now, I think, is a result of like an increase in formats that runners can experience the sport in expanding in breadth in a lot of ways. And I was thinking about this, David and I talked about this this morning and I've been thinking about it and, and sort of came up with a new sort of way to think about it, that being sub ultra, ultra and super ultra. Those are my brands for it. And maybe I'll put this all together in a newsletter at some point and send it out. But, you know, sub ultra being kind of represented by the Cirque series, sky running, golden trail series, ultra being sort of the more traditional 50 K to hundred miles represented by UTMB and Western States and Aravipa mostly. And then, you know, the super ultra stuff that is ascendant and seemingly, you know, uh, you know, growing just as fast as any other segment of the sport right now, represented by like destination trail and these backyard ultras, 200 milers, et cetera. So maybe first, what do you guys think about the categories, my new branding of sub ultra, ultra and super ultra and, just like the, the fact that like the Broken Arrow VK can be thought of as the same sport as the Moab 240, which is happening next week and, and the opportunities present in a sport that has that much breadth. Jay, we can start with you. Yeah, I can, I can start on that. Um, so a couple of thoughts first, um, uh, you know, this is like very specifically ultra sign up related. One of the first things Mark, when we bought the company said to us is, is that I probably shouldn't have called it ultra. Cause like, you know, it's, it's really trail. Um, and you know, we, 
even from the moment we bought it, um, there have been more sub ultra distance races on platform than ultra distance races. Right. Um, but, you know, I would say in, in the space, um, particularly as, as we, we think about how they've been positioned, um, you know, a, a lot of the, um, you know, sub ultra distances have been like entry points more so into the ultra distances. So you've got a race that has, you know, a hundred miler and a 50 K, but then they've also got, you know, a half marathon and a, a 10 K and, and they, they were always kind of treated that way that, that the shorter distances were really just like a way to ladder up to something else. Right. And the ultras were aspirational. Um, and at this point, um, I think it, it's not that there's necessarily a growth and we actually have some statistics on this that there's growth in sub ultra uh, 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 like overall but there's a, a uh, an increased attention in sub ultra and increased attention by elite runners in su sub ultra so it's just getting you know more attention and and it's getting a more serious look the raw numbers of people participating and number of events and all that has not radically changed in that category um, necessarily. Um, but yeah, just to give you a sense then of the, uh, the, the sort of the growth rates, this is, we just took a snapshot. So this is only directional. Sure. Um, but in, in the, uh, in the summer, we just looked at like registrations by distance and growth year on year. So, um, so for the, the, the highest gr uh, growth category, which is a smaller category to begin with, so it doesn't take much to move it off that, is actually uh, the 72 plus hours category. And, and this to me says like, you know, the backyard format and other similar events is starting to, to really take off. It's not that big a category to begin with, but it's growing faster, like six summer year on year was 62% growth year on year. Um, yeah. The next biggest growth category was the uh, over 110 miles category. So we're looking at sort of that ultra, ultra or super, ultra, super, category. ultra. Yeah. Uber Uber ultra. ultra. <laughs> you can Trademark. Um, and, and that's, that was 32.2%, .2 again, a snapshot in time, but, um, and then the, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of third category was the 10 to 27 mile category, which grew about 20% year on year. So again, um, you know, I think it's, it's more, when you look at this, the sub ultra category, it's, it's a growth in attention and a yeah. growth in attention. So, David, I don't know if you've like if there's anything else you want to sort of bring into that. No, you know, one thing that I think is really interesting is, you know, when you look at then this goes back to the creator topic, right? You, you look at trail racing and you can have anything from a VK to, a, you know, a 250 mile race like a, a, available to you. And you go to you go to road running and it's like like the first Model T's, right? You can have any color as long as it's black. <laughs> like that's you've basically got four distances to choose from, right? And only so much variety in those distances. And you come to trail and you're like, oh my God, I, I can do anything here. And that's, I think that's really exciting. And I think for people who, you know, who want to try a 5K, 10K, like want to experience trail, this, this, this is a really interesting and exciting opportunity as more and more race directors are saying, well, yeah, I've gone through the hard work of building a hundred mile course. Let's let's put something else out there for everybody else. And and Laz, the backyards are a beautiful format for that. Um, you know, there's there's there is no race series where this that you have some people showing up running four miles and you have some people staying and running four hundred. <laughs> <laughs> it's just wild, but uh, it's it's a fun time in the sport where distances are getting longer, new athletes are coming to the sport in their early years of their prime and running faster. Um, and we saw it at Broken Arrow, right? Guys guys and girls coming down the mountain, just absolutely flying. Um, and and it's so it's an exciting time as people are running faster, people are running farther. Um, and, so, and we're, you know, who knows where it'll go. You yeah. also are pushing boundary in age too, by the way. This is a change that we had to make our to our platform. We actually had to include 
uh, the ability to enter a result a, a result with a, an age of over 99 years. <laughs> wow. We got a very mad race director who was upset with us because we didn't have the capability to have a hundred year old person. It wasn't anticipated. The boundaries <laughs> pushed. <laughs> we fixed it quickly, but we didn't think that that was. So anyway, yeah. Wow. Congratulations to that guy. Unbelievable. <laughs> so if Subultra is only a perceived growth. It's a growth in intent of attention, not necessarily in participation, at least as significant as maybe what we're seeing on the opposite side in the super ultra distance races. Does that maybe portend the bubble situation where if sub ultra is the on-ramp, it is the gateway drug, so to speak, and it's not growing as fast, does that portend future contraction? Or is that so mean being paranoid again? Yeah, I think you sort of have to, and again, we, um, you know, we talk about trail racing and we talk about ultra racing as two different things. Sub ultra distance racing across the platform is still a, about two thirds of the racing that happens on the platform. So when you talk about the the healthy growth of the sport, two thirds of that growth remains at the sub ultra distance. It just, it, that that's just sort of how it works. And so as long as what, what will be really I think what would be really problematic is if is if you started to see that balance shift and what you had is you didn't have new entrants coming into the sport at the sub ultra distance and you just had people racing the ultras because what that would mean is that you don't have the next crop of ultra runners entering the sport and beginning to so as as long as the sub ultra distance doesn't go flat or decline that means that the sport is growing and it's growing in a healthy way in an, in, in a logical way. Or, you know, if we saw a bunch of people jumping in and all of a sudden the hundred mile distance exploded, we know that something is getting out of whack here because there's a lot of people that shouldn't be racing hundred miles because they probably haven't sort of built their way up to it. And that could be problematic, but as long as we see that growth underneath, I think we're okay. Yeah. yeah and I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to the statistic, you know, that I just threw out, which is, you know, that the 10 mile to 27 mile grew by 20.8% in the summertime year on year. That's healthy growth. Still healthy. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's just relative to other categories, which are smaller categories. It's not growing as fast. It's growing at a sustained healthy rate, but yeah. there are some that are sort of like, you know, blooming right now. Yeah. Well, I think anything that grows 20% year over year is probably in a, a pretty healthy place, not necessarily bubble territory where it's grown 200% like David. But also, yeah, certainly not. Like pickleball? Going, yeah, right. It's not pickleball. Yeah. That may be the bubble here. And maybe a uh, world championship of pillow fighting. Maybe we'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah, but, yeah. Once our race directors start putting pickleball courts on their courses, then we'll know we're in trouble, right? <laughs> With this uh, sort of like segmentation, we're also seeing more hybrid athletes. I just had Anna Gibson on the podcast who's fresh out of college and intending to make her professional career go across road, track, and trail, which is really exciting. Ninka Brinkman, who's been a world dominator in the subultra space internationally, is going to be uh, full steam ahead towards Paris 2024, where she's going to run the marathon for her home country, the Netherlands. David, I know you were sort of wondering about whether or not we'll see more world-class and national class marathoners enter the space. So what do you want to say about that? How are you thinking about the opportunity there to speak to people who would otherwise sign up for a road race or a track race to indoctrinate them into our community? Yeah, if you if you show up to any of the sort of you know, major trail races. So if you go to Western States, if you go to UTMB, you'll notice there are roadies that are sort of hovering around watching the spectacle. And, and they're we, we call them trail curious. They're they're trail they they want to be here, right? They want to be on these trails. They want to see if they have what it takes to to challenge these courses. Um and, and I think that's a trend that's only going to continue. When you look at when you look at track and road racing, it is so uber competitive at the top of the field and the ability for these top athletes to make a really meaningful living, you know, is decided by seconds or tenths of a second. And that's, that's a really tough place to live as an athlete with a really low margin of error. And, you know, entering that space straight out of college that the likelihood of you making a name for yourself, that's 
legendary is probably pretty hard. We we pretty much know how fast humans can run the marathon. It's it, we're we're almost we're almost at the end of of that. Absent some really super shoes or maybe socks or next, I don't know. But um, but we're pretty close. But we still don't really know how fast humans can run a lot of these courses that that are in in the trail space. And if we can. You know, if we again, you know, if we can have healthy growth of the sport, not just from p- participants, but also from non-endemic brands coming to the space um, and helping enable professional athletes to make a professional living in this space, I think what you'll see is more and more road and track athletes saying, "Well, I'm going to go over here. It's more fun, and I actually can make a name for myself over there." Um, so, so that, that that that's what I hope we'll see, and I think Anna is a great example of that. Um, that that she would even consider that. Cause I don't think five years ago, anyone would consider it. You know, I think everyone's hoping Kipchoge at some point, you know, when he's, when he's, when he's done beating the hell out of everyone on the road, yeah. he'll give it a shot, but I don't know. It's funny. I don't know if you saw this, but Kipchoge posted a photo just before the Berlin marathon of him doing a little shakeout run in the streets, wearing the new ultra flies from Nike and yeah. <laughs> shared it in my Instagram story. And I texted it to a few people I know who work at Nike saying, look, Kip Chogi's a trail guy. Everybody better. Watch yeah. It. yeah. yeah. It's so. interesting. It's, it's exciting. And I think from a brand perspective too, allowing athletes to think about their career holistically and having people like Anna who have that intention to race professionally in all different disciplines. It's exciting. Even as I am a diehard trail only guy, uh, I think it's good for the greater running ecosystem, the greater brand ecosystem. Jay, anything else you want to add to that? What David said, or what I said about the professional end of the sport and you know how that's evolving? Uh, no, I, well, I guess the only other thought would be that, um, that I think, um, the, the the extremes that are being sort of um explored by the elites in the sport um you know like with other spectator sports and we haven't really been much of a spectator sport and this may lead into our live stream conversation yeah. but um uh it 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 really is pulling more people in and you know it 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 pulls people in 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 a way that is you know wonderful for those people because you know like it they may they may be couch to trail you know um which is good for individuals good for public health you know good for community um so there's a there's a an important relationship between you know the elites inspiring people and and then you know people who are just deciding that this is something that I'm going to do for my mental health, for my physical health, for, for my relationship health. Um, so I just, you know, want, want to call out that crucial role in mm-hmm. everybody else's experience. Yeah. And it helps that they're all such great people. Like one of the things I've thought about is if there's some data scientist out there who could do an analysis about how many people Courtney DeWalter alone has indoctrinated into trail running just this summer, I'd love to know that number because I would guess it's actually pretty big and it's great to have people like her to inspire us all. So let's move on to the media conversation. Now, a major improvement you guys made to ultra sign up when you purchased it was to stand up a media operation in house. This is part of the registration to race day philosophy. And you recently made some adjustments with that strategy that probably involved some pain. So what do you want to say about the current, you know, media strategy with ultra sign up and how you guys are thinking about it going forward? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we tried for, you know, the better part of 18 months to, to create, original content that that we felt was content about the soul of the sport. So it, we, we were intentionally staying away from training plans and gear reviews and things of that sort. We, we felt like there were plenty of people out there in the space that were doing, um, doing that side of the, um, the, the media creation business that we could, that we could amplify through our distribution, but we really wanted to create soulful content. And it, and it was, it was a piece of feedback that we were anecdotally hearing from the sport was, was that they wanted that. 
And, and so we, you know, we invested a lot of time, energy and resources towards that, that approach. And one of the, one of the benefits of ultra sign up is that we have large distribution. So when, you know, when we create content, we can send it out to you know, hundreds of thousands of people at a time, which was, which is un- really unique in our space. E- even if you look at a platform like outside in, in their trail category, they don't have the ability to reach people at the same scale that, that we do. Um, and so, so we worked hard on, on that strategy and, you know, at a, at a weekly cadence, we were creating content that was really soulful and beautiful pieces that, that we were really, really proud of. But because it was digital media, we could look on the back end and see if people were actually reading it. And, and to our great disappointment and frustration, because we're hearing this, but we're not seeing it. Um, what we saw was that people just weren't reading the content. And so we'd send we'd send a, a beautiful piece out to four or five hundred thousand people and one hundred and fifty people would read it now. Two or three thousand people would read a training article that was in the same same newsletter, or they would read a shoe review. And so, you know, we 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 developed this this philosophy that what we were trying to give. And I have three young kids, and so we go through this battle every night at dinner, right? Eat your broccoli, eat your broccoli, eat your broccoli. Um, it felt like we were trying to feed the sport broccoli, and you know, all the sport. What, what what the sport was demonstrating they wanted was the candy, right? They they wanted they wanted to hear about the new shoe. They wanted to hear about they wanted gels is what they wanted. Oh yeah, the gels. They wanted the they wanted the they wanted the junk at the eight they wanted the junk at the A station, the Twizzlers and the M&Ms and like um and so you know eventually we have to listen to that 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 feedback. whether it's coming to us vocally or not, we can see it. And so what we've done is we took a philosophy that we were going to slow down so that we could speed back up again. We were going to slow down and revisit our content strategy and figure out how we can best serve our customers, which, which again, brings us back to that registration to race day journey. And so what you'll see from Ultra Sign Up in the future is, is a renewed focus on continuing to try and help the runners from that registration to race day journey so they can show up happy, healthy, and ready to race on race day and bring them content that gets them prepared for that. Um, it's it's not that soul content is going to be gone for us forever, but it's it, it's, it can't be the cornerstone anymore just because in all candor, people just weren't reading it, which was really disappointing. Yeah. Um, I shouldn't say it's disappointing. It's, it's the people that read it loved it and we got amazing feedback from them. But it's just not sustainable from a cost perspective to to create it if it's not being read at, at a necessary level. And that I think that's the hard dynamic is, is we know that there's a certain percentage of the community that really, really wants it and really consumed it when they got it. But that just wasn't it's just not big enough to make it sustainable. So, yeah. So maybe, Jay, this would be good for you as the synthesizer like listening to the data in those circumstances to make hard decisions, something that I think about because nearly a hundred percent of our decisions are driven by my personal taste (laughs) and my, my personal bad judgment sometimes. And that's probably why we're having a hard time figuring out our business model. But I think (laughs) this is practical and I think it's good for us all to talk about and, and be open about like, you know, having listening to that data in the moment and adjusting strategy based on the data. Is there anything you want to add to that as the operator and synthesizer there, Jay? Yeah, I mean, you know, these things are always when they're new, they're always jigsaw puzzles, right? I mean, you have to tweak and then see what happens, evaluate, tweak again, and it's just a never ending cycle, right? And so, you know, we have and any you know kind of media operation has three potential legs of the this the stool one is one is written um you know the the other is is the audio format that we're on right now and and then the other is video and it may be that um you know a a type of storytelling is best delivered in a very specific medium and not another one or let's say best received um, whether you like it or not, and this is someone who's a like recovering poet um, coming from, you know, like a, 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 pl- a place that values deeply written media. Um, so so it, you know, I'm not going to say that this is true. This would just be a hypothesis. It may be that the soulful stories are are better delivered 
in an audio medium, or it may be that they're better delivered in a video medium. Yep. And it may be that the, you know, um, the, the sort of optimization uh, content is better delivered in a written medium. Um, you know, so it, a lot of this is just, you know, figuring out, um, you know, w what, what works with what and tweaking as you go, looking at the data and, and continuing those, uh, those cycles. Yeah. So this is just popping into my head here as you talk about the three legs of the stool. I've heard a rumor that you guys are incubating a new podcast that I can't <laughs> wait to listen to. Are you at liberty to talk about that yet? Obviously, this would be a good place to inform potential listeners. Yeah, it's a... Uh... I don't know if it'll be a PG. We we don't know what the rating will be yet, but it's probably not going to be a PG podcast. Maybe maybe we can get it under PG thirteen. But it's uh, it, we no. we felt like um, the sport. And again, this you, you talk about. Oh, a lot of decisions are made by our gut, and th there's no data to just support this idea. We just felt like the sport needed a comedy first podcast, and so um, so we reached out to two guys that we thought could fill that. And so Dom Grossman uh, and Andy Pearson have, have agreed to launch Between Two Pines. Um, if anyone's seen Between Two Ferns, you sort of get a sense of, <laughs> of what we're going for with this podcast. And uh, Jay and I are just as excited to listen to it. They've, they've got full artistic control. We've just, we've just asked them to please not get us sued in the first series. <laughs> <laughs> Don't run off our race directors. The so title that, of the, the podcast only... alone is going to get a cease and desist. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so, uh, so we're pretty excited about it. For for those who don't know, Dom's a professional trail runner, also uh, um, a true rocket scientist. So a, a legitimate genius, and and uh, I'm, I'm sure he'll. He'll make me repeat that over and over again for him, but really a super smart guy uh, and really funny. Andy Pearson is the uh, also an ultra runner, creative director at Liquid Death. And so all the craziness you see happening at Liquid Death has flown out of the mind of Andy Pearson. And uh, they've been two longtime friends. And so they've got they've got really good energy together. And um, so that'll that'll launch the 19th and it'll be a monthly podcast after that. So. Oh, this is perfect. OK, so all of our listeners here, you got to make sure you go subscribe on the 19th. And that's Andy's birthday as well. So you absolutely have to subscribe as a present to Andy. Um, he, you know, he'll be emotionally scarred if all of you don't. That's your little birthday present to Andy. So. Yeah. You know, Dom Grossman is an old and dear friend of mine. We came up in the sport at the same time and we have the most hilarious text chain in our phones that if it were ever discoverable in in a trial, this is one of the reasons why you can't be sued that uh, we'd probably both be in trouble, but I can't wait to listen yeah. to the show. And I know Andy, you know, is also very funny and very talented person himself. So between two pines, everybody go look it up. All right. So, yeah. Let's talk about live streaming and then we'll talk about the dirt circus and then we'll sort of start winding down. David, you and I had a conversation of like the difference between true live streaming and more of like live commentary. And this is very much a new phenomenon in our sport that gives us the opportunity to speak to a much broader audience. And even though David, you and I get frustrated when the world championship of fighting is distributed on ESPN and trail running is relegated to some obscure YouTube channel that we, we can't get that type of attention and distribution that some of these completely ridiculous quote unquote sporting events are getting. So with that as a jumping off point, anything you want to say about the state of live streaming in the sport and the opportunities you think that are present there? Yeah. So uh, a week before I heard about the, uh, pillow fighting championship i i actually watched for about 20 minutes the world slippery stairs championship which the 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 competitors in the world championship were well, it was a fraternity at university of south carolina <laughs> apparently the south carolina puts out the world's best slippery stair climbers um but it you know it it it's it's a it's a commentary on where we are as a sport. It's a commentary on where um, ESPN is a business, right? The, the challenges that they're facing and and the content they're choosing to distribute. Um, but you know, for us, 
we feel like as we talk about the professionalization of the sport and how, how do we how do we empower pros to be pros and actually make a living at this sport the, the the solution is is simple right and it normally for almost all questions in the world it normally comes back to one thing right it's just it's money there has to be money in it in order to make it happen and so when you look at how do we bring money into the sport of trail running to make that happen you do it through through television through through a video medium that's how it happens when you look at golf you look at tennis you look at all the history of those sports once they got on television even nfl football like once that happened it it, it the trajectory and we should say one level deeper it's because of advertisers it's because yeah. brands want to put their products in front of the people who are watching exactly they they want to reach this community which which actually if if if, if you're a if you're a working for Rolex or Amex or Delta, and you're listening to this podcast, this is the type of community you want to talk to, right? This, this is an affluent, educated community that's passionate about their passions and, and you want to make them passionate about you. And, um, and so if, if that can happen, then, the, then the, the doors of the sport all of a sudden become opened. And for us, we feel like there are few things that are more beautiful than some of these trail races that that exist inside our sport. And if we can just bring that beauty into the homes of people that, that all of a sudden that flywheel will start to turn over and the sport will start to accelerate. And so um, broken arrow was, was our first foray into doing that. And it was, it was a huge learning experience. And um, we were, we were really proud of the work that Scott Rokas did on that. And, and we hope that we demonstrated to, some of these broadcast partners that it is possible. It is possible to have broadcast level um, live stream coverage of this sport in amazingly beautiful places um, in a way that the American consumer can, can consume it. So, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. And one of the things that we just talked about is, you know, the sub ultra distance space and David, you and I were talking about how packaging that into a viewing experience that ESPN plus, for example, would be interested in streaming would be much easier than trying to package a backyard ultra or a hundred mile range stuff. So I I think that there's, there's an interesting opportunity to continue. And, you know, the golden trail series has done a really good job of broadcasting and storytelling around these super exciting shorter distance events. And, I think that is really the path forward for us to get on network television or on one of these major streaming broadcasting channels. Jay, anything you want to add to this sort of streaming opportunity, how you guys are thinking about it or the just general opportunities present there? Yeah. I mean, I would just say like specifically our role and our philosophy, philosophy related to our role um, in live streaming is is really more that this is an outgrowth of our being a connector, right? We're trying to connect uh, runners and and races and race directors, right? And so if anybody is out there live streaming, um, you know, we're happy. (laughs) If there's an opportunity for us to step in where there's, let's say, a gap um, and it it makes sense, like, we'll, we'll, we'll step in. Um, but, but at the end of the day, like, you know, I would say with that and, and, and more broadly with our, our media strategy, um, you know, we, we are, um, we're just this point of connection for the community. And so it doesn't have to be our original production. It could be, um, you know, could be ours, could be someone else's, but, um, but it all enhances this community. And so that's where I think David, you you had i think used maybe the the phrase of sort of you know elevating you know as as many you know sort of uh voices in the sport as we can like that's that is also what we've been doing with our our written uh digital media too but but that's our philosophy around live stream it is exciting i mean and it's pretty amazing to see how quickly this has advanced and i think you know, forecasting ahead a couple of years, it feels like it will only continue advancing and we'll have more and more opportunities to get in front of the average 
trail curious or endurance curious person who hasn't fully understood the miracle that is trail running yet. But yeah, for RDs, it's, it's expensive. It's an investment. And, you know, eventually brands and broadcast partners are going to be necessary to help subsidize and offset some of those costs so that race directors can still make a living. But anyway, it's an and until and, it's, and until the brands get there, the community can support it, right? Like it, 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 it I always get such a, a kick out of watching the, the chat at Western States or Hard Rock or DTMB or anyone. And these people watching these free broadcasts are like, they just cannot wait to drag you over the coals about it. It's like, yeah. God, like... This this can be better if, if if everyone writes a check and and helps us make it better. The, the, again, the the quality of live stream all comes down to the amount of money available to, for production, right? Like a, almost every problem is solved with you know better uplinks, better cameras, all, all that sort of stuff. And so there 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 might be a model in the future, not one that we necessarily want to build, but where where these live streams are community supported, right? There's there's some way for people to to contribute money to bring a production quality level broadcast for a race that they want to see. So. Yeah. yeah. As a relatively new small business owner, never has it been more obvious and more, more apparent to me that in order for things to survive, people have to spend money. That's the unfortunate <laughs> reality of the world that we live in. I would love to be able to, you know, just do what I do every day and not have to worry about that part of things because it stresses me out immensely. But, you know, I've I've used that realization to help, you know, buy things from other people who I know are also working hard in the space. So let's close down our conversation by talking about the Dirt Circus. This is super exciting <laughs> stuff. You guys... uh are sort of entering and pioneering kind of a new event idea within the space. And I know it was a long time coming, something that you guys were incubating and thinking about for a long time. So maybe just introduce us to the concept, the schedule, the vision, and how people can get involved. Yeah, I, I can kind of start like historically, you know, again, in keeping with our role of bringing race directors and runners together, like that is something that we've done in the digital space. And, and we felt like, you know, it, it, there was an opportunity to bring those groups together in a physical space. Um, and also, you know, race directors, their, their experience with their runners is generally while they're running around, like completely panicked about all the crazy things that are, you know, could possibly go wrong in a race and all the logistics. And we wanted to create a forum for them to connect while we were bearing the burden of all those logistics. <laughs> And stresses. So we 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 uh, we launched a couple last year. One was in Boulder, and one was in uh, Tahoe, and um, and they went well. And so we've we've expanded uh, to four this year. So um, so we we had the first one in Flower Mound, Texas, which was just last weekend, and it went great. Um, I, I will mention that uh, Rob Goyan, who was um, one of our uh, race director clients at, at uh, trail racing over Texas trot um, is now working for ultra sign up. He's one of our team members and, and he, among other things is actually managing um, dirt circus. Um, so flower great guy, Mountain, by the way, Rob's a great dude. Yeah, he's wonderful. And uh, so, so flower Mountain was in his backyard. That's kind of why, you know, that was uh, chosen as kind of a kickoff. And then from there, um, uh, Boulder, back in Boulder again, uh, then in uh, Phoenix, and and then we end in uh, in, in Bentonville, and um, and I'll I'll say like you know the 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 the, the sweep of these, um, you know, it has, is is mostly the same for the first three. You know, we basically partner with a retailer that is near some trails that has a community with a number of race directors nearby. And we, we put on sort of like a, a, a festival, a party, um, and then everybody goes out for a fun run and, you know, RDs can tell their stories, uh, brands can participate. Um, the last one, Bentonville, is, is a little bit different. Um, and it, it actually uh, is, is different for a, a number of reasons. You know, reason number one, um, is uh, that Bentonville, which probably, I don't know, some pretty significant percentage of people listening have never heard of, <laughs> which is in Northwest Arkansas, um, 
has a thousand miles of of hand cut trails and a ratio of uh, you know sort of races to thousand miles of trails that is incredibly low. Um, not for mountain biking because they were originally you know sort of pushed by that community for mountain biking. Um, but there is just a lot of opportunity there. Um, beyond that, um, David, maybe you can color Bentonville and that event a little bit and kind of what, what makes it different and unique. Yeah. So we, you know, Jay and I had the opportunity to go down to Bentonville and, and sort of see it for ourselves. Um, and, and we were just blown away. There's some really unique characteristics about the way that they've com- compose their trails, the fact that they come out of the city center. Um, they, you know, there's a $6 billion art museum that the trails go by. I mean, it's just, and the, the trails are meant to play on, they're meant to travel on. Um, it's, it, it's really a special place. Like, for example, there's a coffee shop that the closest parking lot to that coffee shop is a mile and a half away. And you go there on any given day and it's full because people have ridden their mountain bikes out to this coffee shop. Is that Meteor? Is that Meteor Cafe? Isn't that in Bentonville? It's like well, um, with the cycling community, or is that different? Yeah, I, I don't think it's called Meteor. I'll have to, I'll have to, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, but, uh, but we felt like they they had done themselves as a community a disservice by trying to brand themselves as the mountain bike capital of the world. And we said, you guys should be the trail capital. If, if like this, this is un, there, there's nowhere else in the U.S. that trail runners can come. At, can experience a thousand miles of virgin trails that they've never, they've never been on. Um, and so we said, how can we help you bring, bring a race to Bentonville? Uh, and, and there's, we don't want to make it sound as though there's no racing happening in Bentonville. There, there is racing happening, but to what Jay said, relative to the distance of trails, the percentage of racing there, that it is certainly not a saturated market. Um, and so we we collaborated together with the local community, with, with some of the organizations there. And we said, well, why don't we do a late summer sort of, I mean, late season, end of year sort of trail party, basically, and and have have some short distance racing, 5K, 10K, and make the 10K a big prize purse. And so the, the, the community put up money for this for this prize purse. Um, Mike Rush with Rush Running, who's a legend, if, if you don't know Mike Rush, uh, He's he, he's the OG race director down in that part of the country. He's probably got the most amazing shoe collection of running shoes in the world in Arkansas. Um, Mike and his team got together and went and found what they say is the gnarliest 10K course in the country. Too hard for most trail runners. Too technical for most mountain bikers. And they said, let's just let's just let's just do it. Let's just put it here. And so. So, we're, we're you know, our, our hope is that that we can be a catalyst to drive. Bentonville forward as being a, a a destination for trail racing. We we are not getting in the trail racing business. We're not we're not trying to create fifty trail races across the country. That the the work that our race directors do is way too hard. <laughs> That's not our interest. But we do like the idea of helping communities that want to bring trail racing to their community. We do like the idea of helping them figure that out and bringing some of our re- breath and scale to help with distribution to make that possible. So if there's other communities out there that are listening that say, Oh man, we, we really feel like we should have trail racing here. Like give us a call. I I can't guarantee that that we can make it happen, but we'd love to have the conversations with them. So. Yeah. I've really wanted to visit Bentonville myself as somebody who pays attention to sort of the gravel and mountain biking scene. The town is, like you said, it's been the world capital. It's become the world capital of off-road cycling. And going back to our conversation we should mention the reason it's become that way is because the Wal- the Walton family, who the owners and founders of Walmart, are huge, passionate cyclists. And so they yeah. are invested in creating that environment there. And I do think you're right that they would be wise to rebrand it to the trail capital of the world, not necessarily the mountain bike capital of the world, and help bring some trail runners down. So that's going to be happening sort of middle of November, 17th and 18th. So we'll make sure to put links to all the dirt circus events in the show notes, including Bentonville guys. It's exciting, man. You guys are really on something here with ultra sign up. It's great to, you know, have gotten to know you guys over the last couple of years. I really admire everything that you do and always, you know, understand the good intentions behind 
you know, the things that you do on the platform. And it's great that you guys are steward stewarding this institution that is ultra sign up into a new generation. My closing question is always the same. That is just who is one person that you admire inside or outside of sport living or dead. And why do you admire that person? Jay, we can start with you. Gosh, this is the one question I didn't prepare for. So um, I would say that my first instinct, you could say it would be a cheat, but I think if I thought about it for a long time, for days, it would be the same person. And it's my wife, which sounds, my wife, Jane, I'll just name her. She's in the next room, by the way. So she's <laughs> yeah, she's listening, I'm sure. Uh, just checking to make sure I, I call her out. I mean, look, you can't do any of these difficult things alone. Um, you know, whether it's running an ultra or, you know, doing a business or raising kids or, you know, whatever. And so the reason um, would be, you know, in in her specific case, you know, steadiness, love, loyalty, kindness, wisdom, intelligence, long-term thinking, people skills, <laughs> um, you know, and again, it doesn't have to be a spouse, just someone close to you. Like these characteristics, they run deep, you know, and and just keep these people around you. I mean, um, the 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 Mahatma Gandhi of your life is likely someone you know uh, right now. So that's it, Jane. Love it, David. Close us down. Yeah, I'm gonna say this quietly because my wife is next door, and and it wasn't her. And if she hears that, she might get upset. But. No, um, yeah, my, my, mine is my father and he passed away in January of this year. And, you know, when, when you lose somebody special, it, it has an amazing way of sort of, um, clarifying your perspective on them that, that maybe you were unable to do prior to that point. And so, you know, my dad and I had a real interesting relationship. I felt like throughout most of my life and yeah, he was, he was one of those guys that, um, I always wanted his approval. I think a lot of boys want that from their dad. So when you're on the field and you're playing every play, you'd look to your dad. That was, that was the relationship I had with my dad. And I, it was, it was peculiar because I never felt like he was always really happy with where I was. I it always felt like I could go further and I could go further. And so I always felt like I was just letting him down a little bit. And then I, as he got sick and I, some of his friends started coming around, they would tell me that, you know, your father would, was, was so proud of you and he would never stop talking about you. Whenever we were around, he was always just gushing about you. And so when he passed, what I realized was that like, he, he was always sort of just, that was his way of making me go that five feet further at the beginning. And when, when he said that he, he developed that into me, I always felt like I had to go a little bit further. And it wasn't that he wasn't proud of me, but I guess he knew that the only way that he could build that character in me was not sort of over over flooding me with 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 praise and emotion. And so it was it, it was an amazing, you know, when this moment happened and I always felt like there was this distance between us growing up um, and it all just sort of went away once I was able to come to terms with, with that was his style of parenting to help me sort of move through life. So long answer. Yeah. But but anyway. I'm going to cry. And, I, and, my, and my wife is great. And my wife is wonderful. <laughs> All the other, that is, well. mom, you too, if you listen, sorry. I was, I was only able to pick one. But. Uh, what a great way to end the show, guys. I'm going to go kiss my son and wife in the room <laughs> next door to me now. But appreciate all your time. Appreciate you guys coming on the show. It's great to, you know, be connected and be able to bounce ideas off each other as we do in our private emails and text change chains. I wish you guys nothing but the best. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks, Dylan. Dylan. We always appreciate you.